So, did that bring you back to your childhood a little bit? Well, let me do it just a little bit more. So, I'm going to authorize you to freely just close your eyes for a second. Hopefully, you'll wake up. But I want you to hear something. "'Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds, while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama and her kerchief, and I and my cap, had just settled down for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter." Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles, his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet and Cupid, on Donner and Blitzen. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle mount to the sky, so up to the house top the coursers they flew, with the sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkling I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. And as I drew in my hand and was turning around down the chimney, St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opened in his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his droll little mouth was drawn like a bow, and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to work and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk and laying his fingers aside on his nose, and giving a nod, up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew like a down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, to all a good night. You feel like a little kid again. Good. This well-known text was written in the 1800s and captured the attention of child and parent of the description of Santa Claus or St. Nicholas. Many of you, I know, were walking down memory lane as I recited that very story to you. But as wonderful as it is, there is nothing in it that celebrates the true meaning of this season. We get all bent out of shape about vendors using happy holidays instead of merry Christmas or Merry Xmas, Lord help us there. But struggle ourselves to truly embrace this wonderful time of year in recognition of our Savior's birth. Jesus' birth wasn't even celebrated as Christmas until December 25th, 336 AD, some 300 years after his resurrection. Churches celebrated the deaths of saints because it proclaimed their ultimate destination in heaven. Christ's own baptism, which is associated with January 6th, and is also called the Day of Epiphany, got more attention than his birthday. Prior to Jesus' birth and even today, which will begin on December 12th and end on December 20th, the Jews celebrate a historic event. The Feast of Dedication, or Hanukkah as we know it today. It's an eight-day celebration of lights which honors the Jews' victory through the leadership of Judah the Maccabee over the most powerful army of the world, the Greek army in Jerusalem in 2nd century B.C. 
And upon reclaiming the holy temple again for their nation, they sought to light the temple's menorah with only one day's supply of oil for fuel. But God's blessing allowed it to last for over eight days. And they honor this historic event for God's saving victory of his people as well as that miracle of that long-lasting light. In John chapter 10, verses 22 through 30, Jesus is even confronted by the Jews during Hanukkah. It says, at, the, at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. And so the Jews gathered around him and said to them, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hands. I and the Father are one. The everlasting life, God's true temple, and Savior of the Jews and even Gentiles stood right in front of them. But instead of saying, glory, glory, hallelujah, they picked up a rock and were ready to beat him to death with it. His words to the Jews are significant then as they are now. When we solely focus on Jesus' birth, we don't truly honor Jesus' deity. <laughs> Psalm 96 says, Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. He comes. The Lord comes because he existed even before Christmas Day. It wasn't an accident. God had revealed himself to the Jews as a cloud and as fire. But Jesus came in the form of a human being, like you and me. And even as a helpless little baby to a carpenter and a virgin. The Jews weren't looking for a little baby king. They were looking for a mighty warrior to give them hope for their nation as a whole. Today, we are looking for the next material thing to fill our homes and our hearts to give us that same happiness, that same hope, which can just fuel us just like that menorah light before Jesus' birth and even today. During this series, I want each of us to recapture the anticipation, recapture the excitement and the joy of Jesus' coming to this earth. I want each of us to love just a little more and give a little more, whether that's time or your money or your resources, just give a little more and share a little more. Of course, Christ did that for us. Better yet, may we find ways to continue his example the other 364 days out of the year. In this study, we're going to talk about people's life before Jesus' birth. But heard about his coming soon. So let's jump in and open our Bibles today to the book of Micah. The book of Micah, chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Micah is located in the first half of this book, the Old Testament, right after our favorite prophet, Jonah, who we studied last year. If it's easier to find, you probably want to start at Matthew and just kind of work your way to the left, a couple of prophets, right before Nahum, and you'll find Micah. For those of you that don't have a Bible with you, I'd encourage you to, on your community card, say, hey, 
I don't have one. We'll buy one for you so the next time you come, you'll have one with you. But today, we'll have them on the screen as well. If it helps, it makes it easier for you to follow. Micah, chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem, Apatha, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, for you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give him up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. And when the Assyrian comes into our land and treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princes of men. They shall shepherd the land of Assyria with a sword and the land of Nimrod at its entrances. And he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and treads within our border. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the prophet Micah. For giving him the message of a hope to come and a hope to be fulfilled and a hope to be regained for all of God's people. During this time, we celebrate Jesus coming to this world. May we remember that there were prophecies about him coming, just as there are prophecies about him returning. And may we be excited and overjoyed that we may see him again and proclaim the good news every day, including Christmas. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just give a little context. Micah is writing about the same time frame as the prophet Isaiah in the 8th century before Jesus' birth. Micah was alive during a serious capture of the northern kingdom when they took the ten tribes into captivity. He's speaking now to the people in Jerusalem as King Nebuchadnezzar's army is about to attack and overthrow King Zedekiah who will become the last king of Judah. There is disaster. There is war. There is plunder and even exile in their future. But God moves Micah to share the message of hope from the most unexpected place. This leads me to our first sermon note. Christ's significance through insignificance. Christ's significance through insignificance. Here, verse 2 again. But you, O Bethlehem, Hapatha, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Now, if you're just blowing through the scripture, you may not have heard a famous Christian Christmas hymn in that text. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see the light. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. And the hopes and the fears for all the years are met in thee tonight. Words matter. And our worship songs flow with the gospel. Here, Matthew, verses 2, 1 through 6. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw a star when it rose and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. The priests and scribes, they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. 
And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. That scripture that those priests and those prophets recited knew that Micah had prophesied from this text about the Messiah to come. And despite Joseph and Mary living in Nazareth, God's plan of Jesus' coming would be fulfilled in Bethlehem. Because he was the ruler of Micah, chapter 5. Bethlehem was much like Allendahl or McClellanville. Just a little blip on the map. It was a stop on the way to the big city. But God chose to bring his magnificent Messiah out of that town. Why? Because God chooses something small and out of the way that changes the course of history forever. 1 Corinthians 1 verses 27 through 31 says, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. The coming Messiah and King was not just a tribal king, but the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he would be great to the ends of the earth, not just Israel. During this time when he's prophesying, any Jew who heard Micah's prediction of the coming ruler out of Beth Bethlehem and would feed his flock in the strength of the Lord would think immediately of two people. David the king and the coming son of David, the Messiah. But Micah is reasserting the certainty of God's promise to David. Through 2 Samuel, in chapter 7, God said to David, I will raise up your offspring after you. Who shall come forth from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Micah reasserts that certainty of this promise not at a time when Israel is like feeling good man I've got to go to Walmart off of the synagogue over on the corner there and buy some presents this is looking good for Hanukkah there was a rising power at that time Israel was sinking into oblivion despair imprisonment were about to befall on this nation And he did this from his own conviction of Jesus' existence prior to his birth in Bethlehem. If you remember in verse 2 of Micah, it says, One who's to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Jesus is coming forth and was from old, ancient days. What does that mean? John chapter 1 Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's what he meant. The Son of God is all of his majesty, stepped down from heaven, and took the flesh of a defenseless baby. Later on in John chapter 1, it says, And the world, Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. 2 Corinthians reinforces this. For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. If there's nothing else you take away from this message, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, just that first part. For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. That's the security you need in this life. 
when it kicks you in the gut and tells you you can't go any further, God has a plan and a purpose for you to overcome. That is why it is through Jesus that we utter our amen to God for His glory, not ours. So for those of you that are in Christ by faith, you'll inherit the promises of God. Christmas is not about our presence to others, but allowing His presence to shine through us to our family and neighbors. And by doing this, we become the beacon of hope and peace during a stressful and even a depressive lading holiday for so many. Which leads me to your next sermon note. Where did I go? Did I just blow through something? I sure did. Holy cow. I, praise the Lord. Holy cow. Where did I go? Christ's coming fulfills God's promises. <laughs> Glad you got it up there. So let's go back a second. Man, that is terrible. Let me go back a second. Why Bethlehem? Why choose Seawee Bay to bless others? John Piper best illustrates this. God chose a stable so no innkeeper could boast. So he could say, He chose the comfort of my inn. Chose, chose a manger so that no woodworker could boast. He chose the craftsmanship of my bed. He chose Bethlehem so no one could boast. The greatness of our city constrained the divine choice. Seawee Bay has always been and will continue to be that little church that could. And it isn't because of me. It isn't because of you. It isn't because of First Baptist Church of Mount Pleasant's backing. It's not because of dumb luck. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And He ordained this body to be the light for this community. And we have continued to answer that call in our personal and even corporate lives. He's used insignificance and magnified His significance throughout this body and this community. But He isn't finished with us yet. And Michael wasn't either to talk about Christ's impact. He makes it clear that Christ is the yes of all God's promises, which I already shared with you. Here are verses 3 through 4. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his neighbors shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. And the majesty of the name of the Lord is God. And they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. He was there in the beginning when God created it all. The Spirit hovered over the waters and God was there and Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were there in the beginning. And God made a promise to Abraham and David that His kingdom, God's kingdom, would reign forever. And He was going to use whomever people thought were insignificant like David, a little shepherd boy, and glorify God through his significance by using David, that little shepherd boy. And then he brought his son as a defenseless little baby to a carpenter and a virgin. Who people thought, it's just a little kid. What's he going to do? But God knew. And that doesn't change today either. That same promise that is over 2,000 years old still holds true to you and me today. And whomever calls you insignificant, say, that's great because God's significance reigns through me. It's not about me. It's about God. He, give, he has given you a purpose. Each of us have been given gifts through His Spirit. 
to utilize and glorify His kingdom forever and ever. That is your goal in life. Do you realize that? You're special. God has a plan for you. Don't waste the opportunity. He has a message to give through you. And there's a lot of seats in here that still need to hear it from each of us. This holiday is either super high for some folks or heavily depressive for others. And for those of us that share a relationship with Jesus Christ, and the only thing we have is that promise from God that someday there will be no pain, no sickness, no war, no torture, no imprisonment in eternity, we have to share that promise with those who are hurting today, tomorrow, and every day. But in order to do that, you got to believe it. Don't worry about buying a Starbucks gift card for somebody. Share them how jacked up your life was and how God changed you and loved you so much that he gave you an opportunity and to have that purpose to share with whomever you're talking to. That's the best present you could give anybody. It's cheaper too. And we know that promise will be fulfilled because lastly, the Prince of Peace will reign forever. Hear verses 5 through 6 again. And he shall be their peace. When the Assyrians comes into our land and treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princes of men. They shall shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword. God bless you. And the land of Nimrod at its entrances. And he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and treads within our border. Michael, Micah spoke of this in a previous chapter. He said, He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide for strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war any more. One day, the ruler, the king of kings, and the lord of lords will return and make all of this a reality. Before he does and brings ultimate peace on earth, we are called to make our own peace. It's our sin, which no one talks about at Christmas parties or tidies up in a nice little bow. And shares with people. And those burdens of those sins are so overwhelming that it is crushing our spirit during the most wonderful time of the year. He shall be our peace and shepherd each of us. But we, like sheep, have all gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Satan is killing us with it. But today is the day to release this sinful presence from our lives. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all and has paid our debt forever. Earlier you sang a song, but I want to repeat it for you. And I want you to understand that those words are having the same meaning right here. God rest ye merry gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day. To save us, not some, all from Satan's power. When we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. My question to you is, is, 
when you sing it, do you believe it? Today is the day to believe the actual words that you sing. Recapture that comfort. Recapture that joy. And when you do, others who don't know Him yet will want it too. And that is the greatest gift that you could share with anyone that's imperishable, infallible, and eternal. So during this season, celebrate His coming again and why He came and share it with someone else and recapture that joy again. Let's pray.